Hey everybody, welcome to Song and Sword Online Church. So glad that you're with us today. God bless you, it is cold. If you're in central Illinois, we are freezing. It's good to be with you in the warmth of your own home. I hope you have a cup of coffee, a Bible open, and a fireplace going. If that's not your case, I hope you got something uh, really warm on. And we're gonna warm up here with just the Word of God in just a moment. It changes all of our lives. And here, here's, no matter how cold it is, we are here every Sunday proclaiming Jesus with a song of grace and the sword of truth. Grab some communion supplies and uh, make sure you're ready for that at the end of the sermon. Uh, but here's the deal. Uh, if you're new, uh, welcome. We're glad you're here. Stick around. Follow us, like us, be a part of the Song and Sword family. And here's the cool part. Um, we are actually in the middle of membership month. And uh, those of us meeting at the Chateau at 9 and 10, 30 every Sunday uh, have a chance to become a member. And so do you online. Today we're talking about transform. If you want to go to songandsword.com, you can find all of that information. Just click at the top on the banner at the top, songandsword.com. Click that banner that says together and it'll take you through the four Sundays. We're talking about four T words that are going to make us members of the Church of Jesus worldwide, but members specifically of Song and Sword. We also want to pray for you, so text that number on the screen, and we'll pray for you. Uh, take your uh, needs and your cares before the Lord. Today we come, uh, last week we talked about trust, and this week we talk about uh, this, this idea of transform. We're going to get to that other T word here in just a moment with a great story uh, uh, from Jesus' life in Mark chapter 5. Uh, when I was in high school, I was on the newspaper staff. Uh, I was that journalism nerd. Actually, I was a sports editor of the newspaper. It was kind of a big deal. In my high school, Arlington High School, Golden Knights, go Golden Knights, uh, we had this paper called The Lancer, and we took it very, very seriously. Uh, I guess I, I never really considered another uh, profession, but if I had to choose another profession other than preaching, sports journalism probably would have been a part of what I would have done. But anyway, our instructor at one point wanted us all to learn everybody's job. So I was not a photographer, but for a month I spent time learning how uh, to take photos and publish them in our monthly newspaper. And uh, so doing photography way back in the 1900s was way different than it is now. We didn't take photo photos with a phone. We had an actual camera with the school owned a camera with a lens that could do different things with focus and a roll of film inside. And when we were finished, we didn't upload it to some cloud. We only had one kind of cloud back in the 1900s, those fluffy ones in the sky that you see sometimes. Um, but in fact, it was quite a process to get to the final picture. We had to develop the photos we had taken. Or to get to our word today, we had to transform them. We had to take them from an image and print it on some film inside the camera to finally the photo paper print that then could be printed in the newspaper. Now it won't surprise you that I did not become a great photographer, um, nor is this a tutorial on how to develop photographs. I barely remember it. I spent one month in the dark room. It, it start, you start in a dark room, and you take uh, the film out of the camera so it doesn't get exposed to light, and you put it in this canister. I don't remember all of it, but it, eventually there's an image that's imposed on this photo paper, and there's a series of trays and you take them in, you, and, and it's in this tray called a developer. It's some kind of chemical. Um, and that's, that's all I can explain to you. But the process was long. It was long just to get to one photo, the one photo that you thought you wanted. Um, but I remember that in this developer stage, it would just be kind of a, a black and white, almost x-ray image. And then slowly but surely, it would fade and fade and fade into a real full picture. And this image that gradually got clearer and clearer and clearer until it was fully developed is a picture of transformation. It transformed from this imprint on film to a, 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 a photo on a paper that we could then take and we could edit it and put in the newspaper. And what's true for photos, believe it or not, is true for Christ followers. After we trust in Jesus, we're in the process of transformation, being developed over time more and more into his likeness. And there's no greater illustration in the Bible than the one we're going to read today. Again, when, when people say to me, I don't read the Bible because it's boring, I'm like, Mark 5. That's the story we're going to read today. I hope you have your Bibles with you. Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Listen to this great story. And they came, talking about Jesus and the disciples, and they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. 
And he lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, uh, he, he ran and fell down before him and crying out with a loud voice. He said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region." Let's pray and ask the Lord to talk to us today about that transforming power of Jesus Christ. God, uh, so many of us have been transformed because you died on the cross for our sins and you transformed us from death to life and from dark to light and from sin to righteousness. And we thank you and praise you for that. But God, now today would you teach us there's still transforming you want to do in our lives. And uh, if there's someone here uh, that's just tuned in, maybe a friend or a family member, that's never gone through the transformation from light to dark, from sin to righteous. I pray today would be the one where they find your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray in the power of his name and the power of his resurrection and the power of your Holy Spirit, God, would you please move? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so to be a follower of Jesus and a member of Song and Sword Church is first to, the first T word is to trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that leads to the second T word, transform, to be transformed by Him. I want you to hear this. We are initially transformed by Jesus saving grace on the cross, but it doesn't end there. A lot of people think, Jesus saved me, I'm transformed, that stamps my ticket to heaven. But honestly, our transformation continues by the power of His Spirit. See, we're transformed by Christ uh, and continue to transform into His likeness until we are eternally transformed in His presence. And so this man from the Gerasenes gives us an incredible picture of what that transformation looks like. And I want to point out there uh, in your uh, notes there on the, the page that is songandsword.com, uh, there with the sermon notes, the first thing I want to point out is this, Jesus transforms us by sending the destruction of sin away. He transformed this guy from all the sinful stuff that was going on in his life. I want you to picture this. Uh, this, this guy is known throughout the whole region of the Gerasenes. It's a whole region on the southeast shore of Galilee. Ten cities make up what's called the Decapolis. You read about that later in uh, chapter 5. But, but Jesus and his disciples have, have rowed again across uh, the, the uh, Sea of Galilee, and they're trying to find a place where they can just relax, and Jesus can do some teaching. And, and there was another storm on the way, by the way. And by the time they get over there, they left at night on the other shore. By the time they roll up, again, it's probably four or five, maybe six in the morning. There's a mist on the, the water. It's still kind of dark. Everybody's kind of tired. And out from the tombs that comes running this crazy guy. He's naked. He's yelling at the top of his lungs. He falls down at the feet of Jesus. What do you have to do with us, Jesus? He's screaming. That word that we talked about last week, he's croaking. He's got this weird voice. He's screaming at the top of his lungs. Literally, he says, um, he says what do you have to do with it? it? Literally, in the Greek language, it's like, what you, what me, Jesus? Why are you here? Why are you messing with me? I can imagine that in this neighborhood and these neighborhoods surrounding uh, the children were warned and the people were told, hey, don't, don't get near Crazy Frank. There's this guy out there, he's just Crazy Frank. Don't go playing out by the tombs. Don't go out there by the water. Stay away, because Crazy Frank is... In fact, we get this description. This man is out of control. They've tried to chain him. That, this one word is for his feet. They've actually put shackles, you know, those, those, um, those things that lock in place around his ankles. 
Um, they have chained him. He, he screams all night long. He's in the tombs, probably in the side of some cliffish kind of thing where they had uh, you know, tombs that were built in the caves. And he's out of control. And he's demon-possessed. I can see it this, as this man comes running out of the, the darkness uh, to the disciples' boat, and they're just, they've been through a storm, and Jesus is stepping out of the boat, and I can just see the disciples just going, okay, start rowing backwards. I'm not dealing with this guy. But Jesus is not afraid. Jesus is not scared. This man is a picture of what happens when sin comes into our life. This man is a mess because he has, in verse 2, he has an unclean spirit. In fact, we find out when Jesus starts questioning him in verse 9, when he says, what is your name? And again, I imagine that movie kind of rendition of demon possession. Her name is Legion, right? That's my impression. Uh, don't try this at home, okay? But Legion is his name, and a legion was a measurement of 6,000 uh, uh, foot soldiers in a Roman legion. Did he have 6,000 demons in him? We, we can't be sure if this is the literal number. I think what it's trying to say, what Mark's trying to reveal to us is that th there were a lot of demons in this man. And he is literally possessed by him. He doesn't have control. The demons have taken over. That's, that's not, I wasn't planning on saying this, but this is extra sermon stuff. When you let some demons in, when you let a little sin in, it begins to take over. He, he, they, he couldn't even speak for himself. Jesus asked the man the question, what is your name? The demons answer. He's living in tombs. He's surrounded by death. He's living in a place that for Jew, by Jewish standards would be very unclean. You wouldn't be near tombs where dead bodies have been laid. He's cutting himself. He's sc screaming out at night, cutting himself. He's naked. He's not clothed. He's embarrassed. He's exposed. He's cutting himself, destructing, and, and he's scaring everyone around him. They've tried to chain him. They've tried to quiet him. They've tried to calm him down, but nothing works. And on top of all this, this man is alone. He's outside of society. He's outside of any relationships that matters. I want you to hear this first message this morning. Sin always, always ends up destroying. And this man is a picture of that fact. If you want to know what sin looks like, if you want to know what the end story of sin is, just read chapter 5 of Mark, verses 1 through 13, and you'll see a perfect picture of sin. See, Satan has this one strategy, to lie to you about sin, to say that it won't hurt you, to entice you to do it, and then just watch sin increase and increase and increase until it destroys you and everyone around you. When we tell this story, um, even as tragic as this man is, everybody wants to know about the pigs. You probably, when I was reading this, said, well, what, what about the pigs? 2,000 pigs, why did so much bacon have to go to waste, right? Maybe it's a bacon thing, maybe it's a pet thing, maybe it's an animal thing, I don't know. Um, but the reality is, it's still another picture of the destructive nature of Satan and sin and his demons. They beg Jesus, Jesus gives permission because Jesus' number one priority is this man and transforming this man from the pain and the suffering of his life into a new life. He doesn't say demons go kill the pigs. He gives them permission to go into the pigs. So this is not Jesus' fault that a hundred pigs or two thousand pigs leapt to their death into the water. It's the demons' fault. Demon said, "I don't." Jesus said, "I'm not going to send you to the abyss." That's another Revelation sermon. I'm going to let you go where, into the pigs if that's what you want to do. And you, what do they do when they get to the pigs? These pigs turn into crazy animals who kill themselves. It's a picture of Satan and sin and his demons. It's destructive. And this man's story is a picture of our story. It's a picture of your story and my story. It's a picture of how Jesus transforms us. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says it this way, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The story of Jesus Christ is that he wants to come into our lives often possessed by sin. Some of us have gone through addiction issues and sin issues and pain issues. We've caused pain in other people's lives. We've brought pain on ourselves because of the sin that we've chosen. And Jesus says, I'm going to send your sin away like he sent these demons away by my blood and my death and my burial and my resurrection on the cross. This is the good news of the gospel. Jesus takes away the sin that destroys us and brings us to his feet. He creates something. He takes a man who's demon-possessed and makes him not demon-possessed 
in his right mind. He takes people like me and you, which are all of us, by the way. If you're out there and you're watching, you're wondering, yeah, but you're a pastor, you have your act together. You go to church with people who have their acts together. No, it's the exact, exact opposite. We're people who admit we don't have our acts together. And we have been like this demon-possessed man. Maybe not as, as, as outwardly crazy to the world, but we know that our sin has been destroying us. And through Jesus Christ, good news is, he has taken that sin away. And in fact, I want to remind you right now, um, on uh, January 28th, two weeks from today, we have a baptism Sunday. We have 10 or 11 that are already showing interest. You can either come to the chateau at 9 and 1030, and uh, you can be baptized during those services, or we can make other arrangements if you live far away. Listen, I want you to take this step because this is a step, this is an outward sign of Jesus taking away our sins and making us into somebody brand new. I want, I want to give you quickly two wrong responses to this idea of transformation and this, this story of this man who was possessed with demons. Number one, transformation means leaving sin behind. Jesus has taken away our sin like he sent away the demons from this man. And uh, since we've been saved from it, we don't go back to it. Sin is something we reject. Sin is divine in the Bible. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But sin is something we avoid that we stay. Can you imagine if this man said, hey, thank you, Jesus, for taking those demons away, but I'm still going to live back up in the hills. I'm going to go by the dead bodies, and I'm just going to keep my life. I don't want any clothes. I'm just going to keep living the life that I've become comfortable with. Imagine if he went back to the tombs. Romans 6 asked this question in chapter 6 of Romans, verses 1 and 2. How can we live in sin when we've died to it? Some people look at the sin, the forgiveness of Jesus, and they're like, well, he's forgiven me, and so I'm, I've been saved by grace, and I'm going to heaven, and so I can still live in sin. But John, the apostle, later writes in 1 John chapter 1, 5, and 6, if we say we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, the truth is not in us. Because we cannot have Jesus take our sins away and then go back to that sin and go back to the destructive nature that sin brings in our life. So transformation means leaving sin behind. But number two, transformation means admitting that what I'm doing against God is called sin and that I need to change. We don't like to define sin in this culture. In fact, we live in a culture, I believe, that would see this man with the evil spirit and say, well, this is just the way he is. This is the way he was born. God made him this way, and God loves him this way. You, you, you do you, crazy Frank. You, you just be who you are. You live out your own truth. And this is the way he is. Don't, don't mess with him. He's not, just because he's not normal by our standards, who says that he's not normal? Who needs to change? In the end, these people from the garrisons ask Jesus to go away. Why? Because they don't want the radical change he's going to bring in their lives. We live in a culture that doesn't want transformation. They want to stay the way they are, and they want to be okay with that. And Jesus does not come to the shore and say, hey, demon-possessed man, you do you. He comes and says, I'm going to change your life. I'm going to transform you from death to life. So our transformation begins with Jesus making us what we never could do on our own. I want you to hear that. You can never begin the transformation process by your own. God sends his own son to destroy our sin, to send our sin away and all the destruction that comes with it so that you and I can live. And so for the rest of our time, just a few minutes left, I want to look at the transformed life after Jesus has made us new. We are a new creation. If anyone has been baptized into Christ, that scripture we just looked at, then we are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. But what does it look like to live in that new? Some people think that being saved is the end, but it's really the beginning of a transformational life and a journey of transformation. So let's look at that, that, that photo that's developing as we become saved and transformed by Jesus Christ. That leads to the second thing I want to share with you. Jesus transforms us to look like and become like him. Jesus just doesn't want to send our sin away. He wants to renew us. He wants to make us something new, a new creation. And that new creation is looking like and becoming like Jesus Christ. Now, you may have wondered where I got the idea that this man was naked when I told the, the story. This screaming, crazy Frank comes running out of the hills, out of the tombs. He's all cut. He's bruised. He's bleeding. He's screaming at the top of his lungs in demon-possessed voices. And on top of it, he's naked. Where do I get that? Well, in Luke chapter 8, 27, it says, for a long time, this man had worn no clothes. And if you remember, when these people come 
and they see all that's happened. In verse 15, they come to Jesus, and they saw the demon-possessed man. Look, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed. They had never seen this before. They are used to the destruction and the devastation and the pain and the agony of his demon possession to lead to his exposure. He had, never been, he had not been clothed in a long time. Can you imagine the humiliation of this guy's sin? And that's our story too. The story is that Jesus wants to clothe him. Did you ever wonder where this guy got the clothes? A again, the scripture doesn't tell us, so I can only imagine in my mind that Jesus, after he sends these, these demons off, and this man is sitting there, probably exhausted, for the first time he has a clear mind and a clear heart, and he's looking at the man who saved him. I believe that Jesus probably said, hey, here's my, here's my cloak. Let me put it around you. Here's an extra tunic. Let me, let me dress you. That Jesus gave him the clothes off of his back so that this man would not have to be exposed and naked. If you squint just a little bit, that's a picture of our salvation. That Jesus looks at me in the nakedness and the shame of my sin. He says, let me, let me change that. Galatians 3.27, one of our key verses today says, For as many of you has, as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Have put on Christ. The Greek word there literally means have been clothed or dressed in. I think the NIV version says, As many of have been baptized into Christ, have been clothed with Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Jesus takes all the shame and the nakedness of my sin and all the pain and all the stuff that I've done in my life and the stuff that you've done in your life, and he clothes, him, he clothes me in his righteousness. He puts his righteousness on me, which means now when you look at me on the outside, you see Jesus. He's transformed me with his clothing so that I can look and act and talk like him. Jesus' robe probably smelled like Jesus. It looked like Jesus. It was Jesus himself clothing this man. And he does the same thing for us. And that leads then to transforming acts of obedience. What am I saying? I'm saying if you're going to dress like Jesus, if you're dressed in his righteousness, then it doesn't hurt to act in obedience to be righteous. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It just means that if you're going to look like Jesus, if in righteousness, if before the Father he looks down on us and he sees us as righteous because our sins are taken away, then we might as well do some acts of obedience that are transformational. And I want to draw attention at this point to the card. If you're, if you're online, you don't have one of these tangible cards. But again, you can go to songandsword.com. You can click on uh, the Together button, and this will be number two card. And you can fill out all these things. And there are three uh, things specifically I want to look at for us today. The first one is, here's a, here's a way that we can have Christ formed in us. We can transform who we are by being in Christian community. I believe you should be in a fellowship of believers every Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. You should come together. If you can't at all make it to Song and Sword Church at the Chateau at 9 and 1030, that's preferable. But we need to be in Christian community. That's why today we're going to encourage you to answer some questions about being in a life group. A, a life group is a group of people that you just gather with and you say, we're journeying together in Jesus Christ. And those groups are transformational. I've been in a life group for the last 35 or 40 years of my life. And I can tell you that the people in those groups, even though I'm the pastor, and many times that gets weird because they're looking to me at the, as the pastor, they pastor me. They minister to me. They have changed my life. And so I want, I want you to understand that meeting with people uh, in Christian community is something that's transformational, makes me look like Jesus. Jesus did this. We're just, only, we're just copying Jesus. We're just following in his footsteps. Jesus was in Christian community. He didn't have to be. He could have just come to earth and hung out by himself and been all perfect by himself and then died on the cross and risen from the dead and gone back to heaven. But in John 15, he says to his disciples, I have called you friends. He was friends with imperfect people. I know some of you are going, I don't want to be in a small group with a bunch of weird people. Life groups are just not for me. I, I'm just intimidated. I'm too shy. Da, da, da. I, don't, I don't want to be around a bunch of weird people or people who aren't perfect. Listen, imagine how Jesus felt, and yet he attended church. He went to synagogue. He was in a life group with his apostles, his disciples. I want you to, I want you to understand that is so important. If you want to transform into the likeness of Jesus Christ, we want you to be a part of a life group, and you can indicate your interest in that today. The second thing is we can serve other people. 
Jesus said himself, I did not come, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. There's simply no way to follow Jesus and be transformed into who he wants you to be without serving. It's one of the things that we are going to push at Song and Sword Church. And so you'll see this. I understand that serving with my spiritual gift will be transformational. If you want to grow, if you want to transform into the likeness of Jesus Christ, you just do what he did. He served. And that serving begins from the inside out. We serve one another, and then we serve the world together. Once we serve one another and the world goes, oh, that's a Christian community. They love each other, and then we can serve people in needs. We do both at the same time. We're not a church that just looks inward and serves each other. We're not a church that just looks outward and serves the world. Those both go hand in hand. Very scripture. I don't have time to to go into all that now, but that's the way we serve. And there are questions here about serving in the church. And you can check those online and you can let us know. Please go through that process. Finally, we can give. God so loved the world, he what? He gave. Our Lord is a giving God. And if we want to be in the image of Christ, if we want to be transformed to be like Jesus, then we're going to have to learn to give. This is not going to be an offering uh, sermon. I'm going to probably do a a series a little bit later in the summer about giving. But let me just say this. The tithe in the Old Testament was the requirement of the law. And when you come to the New Testament, the grace of Jesus Christ, usually things are upped. The ante is upped when you get to Jesus Christ under grace. We're under grace now. We don't have to do the laws. We want to do the laws because we've been saved by grace through faith. I'm going to do this teaching later. Um, I believe that, that, that there is a biblical reality for the 10% of all that we make coming to the church. But in the meantime, if you're not there, here's two things I want, to consider, I want you to consider. In the Old Testament, they were systematic and regular in their giving. Would you take this opportunity? I promise you, You will become more like Christ. You will live in that cloak that you're wearing if you give to his church. And uh, I'm just going to leave it there. You can donate. You can go to songandsword.com and donate regularly. You can set up once a week, twice a week, once a month, whatever. But I can encourage you to give, to be transformed, to look like Christ and to act like Christ. That leads to the second thing I want to share. Jesus transforms us by renewing our minds. See, there's also work to be done in transforming our minds. See, they find this guy in verse 15 again. This is the key verse. They came to Jesus. They saw the demon-possessed or the formerly demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there clothed, and look, in his right mind. He's thinking clearly for the first time. He's maybe thinking his own thoughts for the first time in a long time. You can't be in your right mind with a bunch of demons actually thinking and talking for you. You can't be in your right mind when the whole world's voices are in your ears all the time. You can't be in the right mind when your mind is taking in all the images of sexuality and thievery and violence and all the stuff that we take in all the time. Guys, I want to tell you something. The reason many of us can't think clearly, biblically, like Jesus wants us to think, the reason that we're not being transformed into the likeness of Christ is because we are not renewing our minds. Our minds have been damaged. Like so many demons in this man's mind, he couldn't think clearly, even to the point where he couldn't even speak for himself. And many of us experience that because the only thing we have are our devices and our social media and the media that we watch, and that is more powerful. What are we supposed to do? Well, here's our story. Here's how we renew our minds. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. But look, here's the word. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The word transformed here is a great Greek word, metamorpheo. We get the word metamorphosis. How do we change from a caterpillar to a butterfly? How do we change from a tadpole to a, uh, to a bullfrog? How do we change from a car like Transformers to a robot? How do we change, even though we're in essence the same thing, how do we change? We renew our minds. The best way to not conform to this world, the best way to change and become like Jesus Christ, to be made and transformed in the image of Jesus Christ, is to change your mind. I want to, again, draw your attention to our homepage at songandsword.com. It's on the back of the bulletins that we're passing out live every week. But we have these 10 we believe statements that are essential to Christian thinking today. 
And if you want to be a part of the Song and Sword Church as a member, then I just want you to look at them. You need to know that these are essentials from the Bible. They're the 10 most imperative things that we base everything else on. If you're asking yourself, well, where do we get these things? We get them from the Bible. One of the statements, number six on that list of 10, is that we believe the Bible is God's written word since all of it testifies to the living word Jesus and inspired by God the Holy Spirit. So therefore, we define sin and righteousness by the scriptures alone. In our tradition, the Christian church restoration movement, we had this saying, we, we call Bible things by Bible names. Why is that? Because when the Bible says something's sin or something's righteous, then we pay attention to that. We change our mind. It's not what the world thinks. See, we live in a world that's saying you can do whatever you want. You can think however you want. What is right for you may not be right for me and may not be right for someone. There are many paths to God. The Bible doesn't teach that. We have to transform our minds to think differently. We have to sit next to Jesus in our right mind. And we're transformed. The best way we can do that is be transformed by the Bible. Paul encourages Timothy to be a man of the Bible and those passages I have there in your notes if you want to follow along. But in his first letter to Timothy, in chapter, four, in, verse, uh, in, in chapter 4, he says, devote yourself to Bible reading. And he goes on to say in verse 15, he gives this transforming encouragement. Listen to it. Practice what it says so that others may see your progress. If you read the Bible every day, and you start practicing what it says, you're going to see progress. Other people will be able to see your transformation. Just like these people ran to the beach on that day and saw this man sitting there and saying, wow, he's transformed. He's different because he's come into contact with the living word Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. When we come into contact with the written word, the Bible, we change in the same way. It's transformational. In his second letter to Timothy, uh, he says to Paul, writes to Timothy, the Bible is breathed by God. It's useful to transform us by teaching and by reproving and correcting and training in righteousness. In other words, you can't read the Bible and it not transform you. That's why we do mic talks every day right here on this YouTube channel. That's why we preach this sermon every week right here on this YouTube channel. Why? Because we believe the more Bible we get into our brains, the more we transform our minds and become like Jesus Christ. Well, finally, Jesus transforms us in a supernatural way by his spirit living in us. Jesus transforms us by his Holy Spirit living in us. This man's story was, at the end of the scene, the man who had been possessed by demons. In other words, he had evil spirits in him. He was under the influence of many demons. In other words, he didn't have control. These demons, he had, given, he had given over himself to sin so much that sin possessed him. Sin overtook him. We don't know what that gradual thing was, but he wasn't born demon-possessed. He, he probably went into a series of little sin, little sin, little sin, numb to sin, bigger sin, bigger sin, numb to sin, bigger sin, bigger sin, and then you're so full of it that you're possessed by it. Again, I don't want you to be worried about demon possession. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in you, demons have no place inside of you. Don't worry about that. But I believe if we leave the door open for Satan and sin to move in, demons will. They will move in. But here's our story. We have gone from unclean spirit of sin living in us to the Holy Spirit. Did you know that in Jesus we're being transformed even right now? You may not feel it, you may not know it, you not, may not be aware of it. You're being transformed by the Holy Spirit of God. You are under the influence of another power. I'm using that term uh, um, <clears throat> intentionally because in our culture, you're under the influence of alcohol. But Ephesians gives us this language, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't be drunk, don't be under the influence of wine and alcohol, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. In the same way that too much alcohol will affect your actions and your thinking and your response time. The Holy Spirit is doing the same thing within you. You're under the, uh, the Holy Spirit influence. There should be a breathalyzer test for the Holy Spirit so that we can tell that the Holy Spirit is actually inside us. You don't have to do anything, but you can do something. I'll tell you in just a moment. Romans 8, 11 says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Guys, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. And all you have to do is cooperate with Him. 
All you have to do is be obedient and say, Holy Spirit, I want to grow in the ways you're growing me. I want to hear you. I want to listen to you. Again, the Holy Spirit often speaks through people in your life group, speaks through getting together at church, speaks through the Word of God, speaks through prayer. But He's always always there, and He's always living in you, producing in Galatians 5 the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and uh, uh, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those are the things that he's producing in you. You might think, I'm not a loving person, but are you more loving than when you were? Are you transforming? And if not, pray for the Holy Spirit to show you how he's trying to grow love and joy and peace in your heart because that's the fruit he wants you to bear. We are transformed by the Holy Spirit of God. Guys, to be a part of the kingdom of God and Song and Sword Church is a commitment to this word, transform we can't stay the same. So we need, uh, we need just to be committed as a congregation, and we'll do this imperfectly, and we'll fail many times, but we, are, we want to be intentional and deliberate, uh, have that desire to grow in Jesus Christ. That's our commitment. And here's the good news. Christ starts that transformation. The Holy Spirit continues that transformation. And in the end, Jesus will complete the transformation. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. We're like an undeveloped photo in that dark room. And sometimes it feels like the image is not coming through. But by Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, and by the Holy Spirit living in us, and by a few acts of obedience and trust on our behalf, we are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And someday, we'll see him face to face, and we will be fully seen and transformed from what we were to what we are. In the meantime, we're committed to transform. Amen? So if you would, in light of that, let's, let's take these emblems, something that represents the body of Christ, some bread that you may have laying around. It was unleavened bread in the Bible time and some kind of juice that represents his blood uh, in Jesus' time it was wine, whatever it is for you. Gather your family around or your spouse or, or if you're by yourself, take a few moments and I want you to consider who you were. This man who was demon-possessed probably could tell stories about who he was. But the reality is, is that Jesus came into his life. Jesus came into our life to die for us, to take all the sin and all the pain that our sin has and send it away. Let's celebrate the body of Christ that sends our sins away. In the same way, it took the blood of Christ to cover our sins, to send them far away so that they would never be counted against us. Let's celebrate the blood of Christ. God, <clears throat> thank you for sending your son, for clothing us in his righteousness for giving us your spirit. Would you transform us now into the people that you desire us to be for your glory and for your honor. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Stay warm.